This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm here with Parisa Noble. Parisa, thanks for being here today. Hello, thanks for having me. So we've got a great show today as part of our independent digital transformation movement and our content that we're sharing here today. We're going to have a discussion first uh, later today with uh, Tony Ford, who's a consultant at Third Stage Consultant, Third Stage Consulting, I should say, and he's leading a Dynamics 365 ERP uh, implementation quality assurance program. So we're helping a client uh, keep their project on track and help them identify risks as part of their their transformation. So we're going to talk to Tony about some of the lessons learned and some of the findings and challenges that he's had with this large multinational uh, D365 ERP implementation. So we'll have some good lessons from him. And then later in the show, we are also going to be speaking with uh, Bonnie Tinder, who's the CEO of a company called Raven Intel, and they gather reviews and ratings for systems integrators. So if you're looking at potential system integrators, um, she provides a great resource for people that are looking for peer reviews, customer reviews, agnostic and independent reviews, unbiased reviews, all that good stuff. So we'll talk to her about what she's seeing in the market and some of the things you should be thinking about as you evaluate potential system integrators. But before we do that, before we get to those guests, um, you came across an interesting article that you were telling me about, Parisa, about uh, what is it, Phil in accounting, having his job taken over by robots or something? It sounded crazy and futuristic. So it, it sounds like a great topic. What, what's this all about? Oh yeah, the robots are coming for Phil in accounting, according to the New York Times. Um, super interesting article on artificial intelligence and how, you know, again, technology is evolving even further and further with AI and machine learning and what impact that's having on the workforce and as i was reading it honestly i was the way it was positioned is it was kind of like just talking about automating processes so you know this new robot can come in and you know approve expense reports and you know just make things more seamless which sounds like what erp systems could probably do right so initially when i was reading it i was thinking we were talking erp digital transformation but they we're specifically talking about robotic process automation or RPA. So I'm curious, have you heard of it? Is that rel like, how does that relate to ERP? Is it the same thing? Are they things that go hand in hand? How does it work? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, it's, uh, I guess, yes, all of the above to your, to your questions there. It, it is, uh, artificial intelligence is something that uh, can be part of ERP. And it's something that more and more ERP providers are building into their technology. But it's also a standalone technology too. There's also providers out there that just provide uh, just standalone uh, ERP or standalone artificial intelligence types of capabilities. Um, but account, it's interesting that the article is about accounting because that is one of the more common areas where you're starting to see machine learning or artificial intelligence, robotics, robotic processes, whatever you want to call it, um, being baked into um, some of those processes. So, you know, for example, um, you know, some providers like SAP, who uh, is, is one of the larger ERP providers, they have um, sort of automated um, AI robotics sort of AP approvals and invoice approvals. So for the accounts payable processes, you know, you could have AI telling you, you know, which one should be approved and which one shouldn't be approved or which one should require some sort of manual human intervention. So that's just a real sort of a minute or a, or a very specific example of where we're seeing AI. But to answer your question, yeah, it, it is something that's being baked into uh, ERP systems more and more. That makes sense. And I mean, it sounds like so at the core, AI is pattern recognition, right? And it's it's these algorithms that are used to identify patterns and over time and see how they can 
I, you know, just build on what we already know today. So it's, it's affecting accounting, but it's also affecting doctors, lawyers, bankers, and really every industry, which is kind of interesting because in a sense, you know, I remember going to uh, a women in technology conference a couple years back um, with the Colorado Tech Association, and they had someone from Google there that was talking about their AI efforts, um, specifically in the medical field. And I'm just going off of memory, so bear with me here, but they were talking about how um, they had a a system that would take pictures of people's eyes and be able to identify over time their risk for um, heart disease due to diabetes. So they were taking pictures of people who had diabetes. And over time, the machine was able to identify which eye was for a male and which eye was for a female beyond, you know, also identifying what risk you had of developing heart disease due to diabetes. But it's interesting because up to this point, there has been no discovery of the difference between a male eye and a female eye, but this robot figured it out. So it's interesting to see how it advances um, just kind of what we know. And I think at that point, they still didn't real, you know, they hadn't dialed in on what it was specifically that this um, machine was catching on with identifying the sex of the person. But it just is an example of how much artificial intelligence can kind of advance us but is it scary i don't know and it's you know obviously this conversation in relation to the workforce is it going to impact our jobs are we more at risk because these robots could come in and take over you know fill in accounting's role at at his organization yeah yeah it's uh it's a it's a great point and, and it's it also brings up a whole host of other issues ranging from, you know, ethical issues to organizational change management issues to operational issues. I mean, it just affects so many different things. And, you know, you think about the kind of culture you're trying to create as an organization, you know, so on one hand, you're, you're probably trying to, or a lot of organizations, I should say, are trying to build a, a strong culture with, with a, a engaged workforce, a motivated workforce. And then on another hand, they're trying to deploy new technologies to make themselves more efficient. And those two things, I think, could potentially be in conflict because, you know, whether you as a business owner or a leader like it or not, people are going to be threatened by this whole idea of total automation of people's jobs. And even if it's best for the company, it's just not always going to go over well uh, with employees. So it's a really interesting topic. It's super interesting. And then I'm, it also opens up the conversation of business intelligence, too, because I know that that is another arm of it. So I'm curious, what's the difference? Artificial intelligence, business intelligence, is that something that goes hand in hand? Does BI use AI or tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Well, in addition to both sounding super cool, like really cool (laughs) buzzwords, uh, they, they have some similarities. So the AI I would say is more, um, you know, using data to make decisions or to, um, modify processes or evolve and improve over time. Whereas business intelligence is more the, providing the data to a human that can make sense of, of that data to turn it into information. So in other words, you know, rather than just looking at, you know, a P&L profit and loss statement, you know, you could look more intelligently into some of the business intelligence behind, you know, what, what's my profitability by product line or geography or sort of slicing and dicing information in different ways you can analyze a business. So it's, it's still business intelligence is still intended for human consumption and human decision making, whereas artificial intelligence is more taking the same data, you know, taking operational data and inputs to make more of the decisions itself and humans become more of um, more of an exception or, or, you know, humans intervene in in exceptions only. So it's, it's a bit, bit different, a bit futuristic, a bit freaky, but also pretty, pretty cool as well. Yeah, very cool. I don't know how I feel about it. Like, I understand why people are nervous about it, but I also see how much it could, you know, propel us forward, too, in every industry. So, I don't know, yeah. mixed feelings over here. How do you feel about it? Are you scared of these robots? Well, <laughs> well, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of the 80s because I grew up in the 80s, so shows like Terminator and um, other, you know, there's just a lot of, in the culture, especially with movies and entertainment, there's a lot around robots and AI and computers taking over the world. So, you know, that was sort of a fear that was instilled, you know, in children of the 80s back 
um, you know, growing up. So, you know, there's that, there's that, you know, personal baggage, which maybe that's TMI for this show, but, um, you know, I think, uh, for a lot of people, it's, uh, you know, I think it's a mixed thing. I think it's, uh, I think it's a lot of good opportunity. I think at the end of the day, um, let's just say AI were to displace people's, people's jobs, or at the very least, pe- what people do in their jobs. I think it's up, it just puts more pressure on the organizations deploying those sorts of technologies to figure out what are you going to do with those people? And, you know, what's the right answer for, you know, if you automate 50% of my job, what are you going to do with my, the other 50% of my time? Are you going to furlough me? Or are you going to give me something else to do? Or are you going to retrain me or reskill me for something else? And that's the sort of deliberate strategic thinking that people have to have beyond just, I'm going to put in AI and automate a process, because I think that's sort of where people, that's as far as a lot of people get. They, they think, oh, great, this is going to make us X percent more efficient, save us X million dollars or X you know dollars per year. Um, but they don't think beyond that a lot. And I think in a lot of ways, even though the benefit of AI or the potential benefit of AI is greater than a lot of technologies that have come out in recent years, it's also a lot more, there's a lot more disruption that it can cause in trying to get there, if that makes sense, just from a human, you know, employee sort of perspective. So probably mixed feelings, I'd say too. I think there's a lot of upside potential, but I don't think people in organizations in general have really figured out how to, you know, coexist with technology, if you will, you know, the humans, how to combine the humans and the technology in that way. Right. And you mentioned disruption too. Something that they were touching on in this article is that that's been the very thing that's been holding a lot of executives back from making a change and adopting, you know, robotics or, you know, automating to a certain extent because they don't want to fully disrupt their team, disrupt their workforce. They don't want to lay off, um, you know, go through a round of layoffs after doing a, an implementation like that. But the pandemic seemingly acted as a catalyst for these companies to adopt this type of technology because people are already remote, people are already getting laid off. So it's almost like it's correlated. So I'm curious, did you see the ERP industry uh, go along that trend too? Did you see um, an uptick in digital transformations on the ERP side specifically um, in 2020? Yeah, it, it started off, I'd say, right right after the pandemic struck, you know, when the, the lockdowns and the economic impact started to become clear. I say the opposite happened. A lot of companies paused their projects or really slowed things down just to get a handle on, you know, what, what in the world's going on in the world today. Um, but once, you know, those first, you know, four or eight weeks passed it in the pandemic, I think organizations realized, okay, well, this is just reality. Now we've got to figure out how to navigate it. And in a lot of ways it, it exposed the deficiencies that, a lot of organizations had with their technology that they were able to get by in the past, but now with the remote workforce or people that are more disparate or or spread out in multiple locations, um, you know, suddenly their old system just couldn't handle that sort of, um, you know, diverse access to the, to the technologies or whatever you want to call it, especially organizations that were still using, you know, mainframes and uh, VPNs to dial in to get to the system. I mean, it just, that just isn't built for, you know, a, a partial remote workforce. Um, so I think it, it did accelerate uh, transformation quite a bit. And then cloud as well. You know, think about the whole benefit of the cloud is that you're not hosting the technology in your office. You're hosting it, you know, outside your four walls in the cloud. And that's perfect for a remote workforce because it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, what device you're accessing from, you can still get to the cloud and get to your, your back office ERP system. So I think in a lot of ways, in the short term, the very short term, it, it slowed things down from what we saw. But longer term, it's actually, I think, accelerated some of the digital digitization of, of businesses. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, in every aspect, technology has been kind of the, everything's hanging by that thread of technology through the pandem- pandemic. I mean, imagine in, was it the was in the 1900s when the Spanish flu came? I mean, they didn't have technology like we have, obviously, today. And that was probably a very different pandemic. So, you know, obviously pandemics are a no-go. We don't like those, but uh, at least we have technology to help us get through it. And it's interesting to see how it played as a catalyst to adopting these newer technologies and kind of pushing us forward in that sense. Yeah. I think where we're bringing it full circle back to the AI question or, you know, how AI is used and how ERP can be used to automate businesses as well is, 
you know, tying it back to the pandemic, you think about supply chains and how supply chains were disrupted during the pandemic. And that's, that's an area where AI and business intelligence and or business intelligence um, could, could have more effectively helped anticipate some of the problems that were created in supply chain. So in other words, um, AI is used in some supply chain management ca- functions and capabilities that allow you to anticipate where potential bottlenecks might be or risks in your supply chain might be because you're too heavily concentrated on one vendor or one geography. And that's what a lot of organizations found themselves in once the pandemic hit is they found that, you know, we've only got one supplier in China and we can't get the goods to and from, you know, raw materials to China. We can't get the, you know, the finished goods from China. And that just created a lot of disruption there. So, you know, not that AI would have solved all those problems, but it might have anticipated or identified that as a risk sooner that, you know, people could have intervened and made some sort of change to their supply chain. So that's an example of maybe a broader scale implication of how AI could be used in, in particular with a pandemic like this. Right. See, it's not scary. It's helpful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I just need to stop thinking about Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, Terminator when I think of <laughs> robots and AI. So. <laughs> Right. That's. I mean, I'm sure you're not alone in that perspective. Right. If it turns into that, then we have a problem. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, good. Well, that's that's a, a good good topic, and uh, certainly a, a very timely topic. Very, um, you know, emerging technology that's being built into ERP right now. So, well, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to bring on uh, Tony Ford onto the show, and he's a senior manager at Third Stage Consulting. Um, he's actually leading a, a transformation involving a large multinational retail organization. And we're going to talk to him about some of the lessons learned there and what some of the risks and challenges are with that deployment as it's happening real time right now. So we'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. Are you ready for transformation in 2021? Are you ready for change? Well, we want to help ensure that you're ready at Digital Stratosphere on April 20 through April 22nd. Digital Stratosphere is the only technology agnostic event of its kind, and we're bringing it to you digitally. This unique event is intended for anyone about to go through any sort of transformation, whether it be a digital transformation or a business transformation. This event is going to cover topics from experts ranging from strategy, to planning, to program management, to change management, to technology, everything you need to know to make your transformation successful in 2021 and beyond. And if you're one of the over 1,000 people that attended one of our past Digital Stratosphere events, this one promises to be bigger, better, and even more stratospheric. And the best part is that because this event coincides with Third Stage's three-year anniversary, we're providing the first day of keynote sessions to you with no registration fee. And if you would like to attend all three days of the conference, we've provided deep discounts to celebrate our three-year anniversary. So bring your entire team to Digital Stratosphere and get ready for transformation. Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm here with Parisa Noble. And you can find us every Wednesday on YouTube at 10 a.m. Eastern Time in the United States, 3 p.m. London, and 11 p.m. Hong Kong. You can subscribe to us on YouTube to watch the video on demand. And you can also subscribe to us on all the usual podcast platforms like Apple and Google, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio. Um, I was looking at the analytics of all the different podcast platforms people use to watch the show, and there's so many different platforms I'd never heard of. So crowd or not crowdcast, but just a bunch. I can't even remember the names are so random. So whatever, whatever random podcast platform you might be using to listen to podcasts, be sure to check us out. Um, I'm excited for our next guest. First time on the show, his name's Tony Ford. He's a consultant or actually a, a managing consultant that's been with Third Stage for a while now. And the reason we want him on the show is to talk about a transformation in progress. We're, we're actually providing some quality assurance and 
oversight and just providing the overall governance for a Dynamics 365 implementation for a large multinational retailer that is based in Saudi Arabia. So um, the reason uh, this case study is so interesting is because the project is happening right now. We're, we're in the midst of moving from design into build uh, for the new technology and you know it's a perfect time to bring him on the show and talk about what some of the initial findings are and what some of the initial challenges and lessons are from that project. So without uh, any further ado, uh, Tony, thanks for being on the show today. Uh, appreciate it, Eric. I'm glad you invited me. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Good to have you here. So we, we want to unpack this case study that uh, you and I have been talking about. It's a client of ours. Uh, but maybe to start, uh, even though we can't mention them by name and or reveal any sort of confidential information, what can you tell us about the client as far as size, industry, just a general overview? Why don't we start there? Yeah, um, the client's a major Middle Eastern uh, furniture retailer. Um, they're going through a major digital transformation across uh, five areas of their business, including um, sales, uh, customer relationship, man management, finance, HR, uh, supply chain, complete supply chain with procurement, order fulfillment, warehousing and logistics, and another area they call communications and design. Uh, they are implementing Microsoft D365 uh, and the major suite uh, application suite areas are CRM, retail and commerce, uh, financials, uh, let's see here, supply chain, HR. Uh, they've engaged Microsoft and a third party provider that's regional uh, to do their system implementation. Uh, provide system implementation services. Uh, they are anticipating going live uh, late um, 2021 uh, toward the end of the year, December timeframe. So uh, that's pretty much what they're doing. Uh, they're heavy into the project. Uh, they're, they're in the late analysis phase going into design at this point, uh, but they're, they're moving forward. Okay. And why did this... Uh particular organization, why did this client decide to go through this transformation now? In other words, why didn't they do it years ago or why didn't they wait till the future? Is there, is there some sort of tipping point or impetus for triggering this, this transformation now for them? Yeah, they've got a couple of major, uh, I'll, major, I'll call it major events that have kind of gone on in their industry. Um, uh, one is obviously is the, the way that they're interacting with their customers changing and evolving. Um, especially from the standpoint of doing a lot more um, digital uh, online type of uh, interaction with their customers. Um, that's happening more and more frequently. Obviously, of course, given uh, 2021 with the pandemic, you know, we've all gone through a whole lot of digital uh, changes of how we conduct business and do business, um, uh, whether it's like we're doing right now or whether it's interacting with the customer through a sales channel, um, it's changed quite a bit. That's probably the you know the biggest thing. And I don't. And given their technology platform right now, I think the ability to adapt and move with the changes become a little bit more difficult for them. In addition to that, their uh, growth has increased tremendously uh, in their uh, in the the in the country of Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's a lot of development going on. There are a lot of government initiatives that are pushing. Uh, the development of real estate. Uh, and so since they're in the furniture business, obviously there's a huge growth in furniture sales. So if you combine that with a change in how sales is being done and an increase in the, in, in the sales uh, due to a lot of uh, external factors in their, uh, in their market, uh, it's pushing them to realize we may have some limitations on how we can uh, adapt to the change and, and grow with it. So I think that's a big, big reason. Uh, they've got a whole army of, of um, strategic objectives that they've aligned up with this, but if you want to get down to the core root of what's kind of pushing them down this path, those those are a couple of real big things that are pushing them down this path. Yeah, yeah. And so they're being disrupted in their own way, just like a lot of organizations in today's day and age. And it's yeah, of yeah, of just a lot of changes. Towards. Right, just a lot of change. And I think, again, ability, you know, if they've got, oh, and if, from what I can see, and I'm not... You know, I'm not in a pers uh, position to get real close to some of their older technologies, but from what I can see in some of the high-level diagrams that I've seen around their uh, current platform, you can see there's some restrictiveness in how they might be able to, you know, um, change uh, with their with their business uh, and their customer base. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So, so what did they hire us to do? So they decide, you know, for a number of reasons that you just described, they decide they're going to go on this journey, this whole transformation. Um, they pick. Dynamics 365, they pick a local system integrator. What did they, why did they hire us and what, what are they asking us to do for them? 
Yeah, um, uh, uh, they've hired us to provide project um, quality assurance. Uh, that's a big uh, phrase, but uh, if I kind of focus it, there's kind of two areas of focus that uh, uh, they want us to participate in and help them with. One is an ongoing, um, I'll call it project health check, where we're actually providing this uh, review and assessment of their abilities to monitor and control the project. Uh, over time, uh, we we're doing it, you know, twice a uh, twice a month, uh, you know, about the beginning of the month, middle of the month, uh, and we're reporting directly to their steering committee uh, as well as their project management team what we're seeing and what we're observing about how they're conducting the project, and what we're doing is we're looking at not only how the project management team is managing the project, but uh, the implementation methodology and approach and how they're going about doing and delivering on the uh, uh, on the project. Um, that's an ongoing activity. Um, the other side of the coin here is we're also providing what we mm, at third stage would call stage gates, uh, where we are um, in the, at the beginning of a particular, and it's, it tends to match up pretty well to the phases of the project. So they've got six phases of the project. Um, and uh, the first couple of weeks of the project, you know, we're going through a particular assessment in a particular area focused to a particular phase of the project. For example, uh, when we landed on the project, um, uh, and we kind of got there a little late, so we had to hurry up and catch up. But, you know, the first activity was to do a project startup uh, a review and assessment just to make sure that a lot of the um, mechanisms in play were in place to effectively manage the project. So, you know, there, there, were, there are six of those, and each of them has a formalized report where we assess their abilities to start up the project, the analysis, design, uh, development, deployment uh, 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 phases, and just kind of making sure that, you know, we have the right standards and procedures in place to be effective, uh, that they have the right uh, procedures in, to be in, in place to be effective. So when, when they hired us, was there any early warning sign that they were seeing or any concern they had with the system integrator or the implementation in general that was specifically why they hired us? Or was it more of a risk mitigation way to head? That's a really good question. Uh, you know, it's never come up in the conversation, but I have to believe that they, they, they had some concern. Um, obviously, it's always a good idea to have Project QA uh, and, and more, um, more importantly, a third party so that you can have a perspective outside of the, the folks who are actually involved in this, kind of like the, the police, uh, police and the police, right? And you want to make sure that you get a third party from the outside, making sure that um, we're getting, they're getting a third party perspective of things to make sure uh, uh, everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing in the right time in the right place. So I, I didn't get any impression when I walked in the door that um, there was anything particular, nothing was communicated to me. But obviously, as we um, continue our conversation here, you'll see that there was a few things that uh, began to surface. And, and maybe they already knew that. And they just needed a third party to come in and say that. Uh, but that never was formally communicated to us in, in that way. So, Right. Yeah, it's interesting <laughs> because a lot of clients, it seems like they're kind of split. You have some clients that say, you know, hey, we see a problem here, we see a risk, and therefore we want to hire you third stage to come provide the quality assurance here to help us remediate that problem. And then you have other clients that say, hey, we don't, we don't see any problems yet, but we don't know what we don't know, and we want someone to just help us through the through the journey. So it's it's interesting how uh, you, you get both kinds of clients. So it sounds like they it's a TBD on, on the real reason why they, they brought us in. Maybe it's a bit of both. You know, as we got into the process uh, and you start to get a feel for some of the – um, project dynamics and interaction but just, uh, with the different factions on the project, you, you did get a feel that maybe, for example, maybe the steering committee was a little concerned and, and wanted a third-party perspective. Um, you, you, it's not a spoken thing, and we'll talk about, maybe talk about some of the cultural things later on, but it's, it's not necessarily a spoken thing, but you get the impression that someone was maybe seeing some red flags that maybe kind of caused some concern and they thought they needed a third party to come in and, and assess what was going on. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So, so we're in the early stages of the project. You mentioned that we're, we're sort of in that design uh, late, late in the design phase of the project. Um, what, what uh, at this point in the project, what are the, some of the biggest challenges and uh, risks pitfalls that you're seeing so far in this whole, uh, QA process. 
Okay. Uh, well, let me just talk about, let me just talk in general, just some general conversations around some learnings that I've had to go through, uh, given the dynamics and the distance and that so forth, things related to the project. And then we'll talk a little bit about some things a little bit more specific to the actual work. But um, uh, as far as my interaction with the, the, the client itself, there's been a few little challenges that are probably a little bit out of the norm uh, for me um, in particular. Um, I, I do know, culturally speaking, there's a few differences that I've had to adapt to, but uh, uh, nothing major. But, you, you know, you can see some of the change. For example, I'll give you a good example. Some of the, the use of the English language, um, uh, a little different. You know, uh, uh, we Americans, we, 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 we recognize the multi-use of single words, but... Sometimes our uh, our foreign friends don't necessarily always recognize that if we use word in multiple ways, it means multiple things. So I've had to adapt a little bit to make sure that I'm communicating in a way. Uh, and I've even found myself, uh, you know, it's kind of like when you when you're around folks and they use this, they have a um, a particular way of saying things. You start to say it the same way, right? Well, I've tried to use certain words in the same way because they recognize it in that way. So they use the word alignment a lot for agreement. So I've had to kind of flip and, and make a couple of minor changes like that. Um, um, there's a little bit different style of, 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 of communication and management. There's a little bit more, they're a little more hierarchical. Uh, so they want a little bit more of an order in the communication, um, which um, that's okay. I understand that. Um, um, there's a little bit more of a need for completeness of answers as opposed to having partial answers, and answers where we have some open-endedness to uh, the answer to, to a question. And I started to realize that too in the implementation methodology that they were uh, using on the project, uh, a need to, to get complete answers. Um, and one of the issues that you start to see in the new way of doing software implementation and development is when you start doing a more iter iterative approach, you don't have all the answers uh, as you're going through the various cycles of the iteration. Of course, hopefully what's happening is you're getting more information and more information as you move down the cycle. But early on, you might not have all the details that you need, but you still have to move forward in the, uh, in the process. So mm, that's a little bit different uh, um, uh, from that perspective. Um, uh, from the from a standpoint of how to operate from a distance, um, it's been a little bit of a, a challenge in some places because um, uh, as you're doing QA, you know, you have to do a couple of things. One is you want to review artifacts and to make sure that you're seeing some of the documentation uh, and the standards and the templates and the things like that that you need to see. Mm. At the same time, that gives you one level of understanding, but the other level is to get a feel for what the people are thinking about the project and how it's moving forward. And so getting a chance to have some interaction with the folks who are actually, you know, doing the work and participating, it's, uh, it can be very invaluable because, you, you know, on the surface, things might look well, but, you know, sooner or later, you'll, you'll, if things are not moving well or if they're moving well, you'll hear it from the, the, the folks who are involved in the project. So that's a little bit of a challenge um, because of the time difference, uh, the remoteness. Um, uh, because of the nine hour difference, it's a big difference um, of time. So uh, having, finding time to communicate. So well, I'm in the, it's early in the morning for me, it's late in the afternoon for them. Um, and it's time to go home. Uh, so finding some time to be effective at uh, communicating and getting information from the participants can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, uh, so the time zone and the distance, they all make a little, but you know, so we've had to find some creative ways to, it, luckily they do record a lot of the sessions, which is good, uh, because that way I can participate without physically being, uh, in a live, uh, live meeting. I find myself often on the weekends and some evenings, uh, rather than watching television or something like that, uh, listening to some of the sessions to see how it was going. Um, so, uh, that allowed me to participate, not just in work sessions and, and I'm not there to critique the work. I'm just trying to see how it's going and what they're doing, how they're delivering and what they're delivering out of the process. Um, the other area is, is sitting in on, you know, what I consider important project status meetings, uh, seeing how the teams are reporting and seeing how 
deliverables are, are being doc- how things are getting documented and how you know what the st- how to reporting the status and that sort of thing so uh, having those recordings were was probably the biggest help for me from the standpoint of getting some um, real involvement in what they're doing just so I can observe and, and see what's going on one of the things I really early I learned early early on was that uh, reviewing the artifacts that they were producing wasn't always giving me the perspective that I really needed to get. So uh, that was a really, really big help. Uh, And then the last thing I think was probably um, the turnaround on questions. Of course, the time difference causes, you know, you, there are times when you want to ask just some simple questions and Sometimes, you know, the fact that you're remote and you don't have this immediate, you know, I can walk around the corner and talk to someone and get a quick question um, or even an email uh, for that fact. You know, you might have to wait 24 hours for an email to come back just because the time lag was so significant. Uh, uh, they're, they're asleep when I'm awake and vice versa. So you just, uh, you know, just got to find a way to get around that kind of thing. So those are some of the logistical things that were making um, the situation a little bit difficult, but you know, you learn, you, you adapt. I think I, I've often talked about this, but, uh, I have a phrase where you adapt, improvise and overcome. So you just have to find a way to, to make it work, uh, when you're in these scenarios. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, you hit on the, the, the sore spots for a lot of organizations, maybe not sore spot, but the, the challenge that a lot of organizations are having in this day and age, whether they're you know multinational and, or just dealing with a remote delivery environment where, they still have segments or in some cases, all of their project teams spread out throughout the world and collaborating remotely. So you, you kind of hit on some of the key, the key challenges there. Right. One of the other challenges before we, before we move on, one, one of the other challenges that uh, I encountered too was, um, you know, and, th- and this is not unique to this project. This is probably more unique to a quality assurance function, which is uh, walking in and, and, tr- and, and having to gain the trust uh, of the project uh, team because you know you walk in the door and you say your QA so the first response the first thought in their mind is you know this guy's walking in the door he's just there to kind of be very critical of me and and uh, and, and it could be a negative it could be a, perce- a negative perception attached to whatever he's or she is uh, uh, whatever the assessments the outcome of the assessment so you know you 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 have to learn to overcome that and we did we 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 walked in the door I learned a long time ago. Um, uh, the way to overcome that is to tell folks, well, I'm not just coming there to be critical. I'm coming there to be critical, but I'm coming to bring uh, uh, some value to help you get better. And I think when you start to communicate to folks that you're just not here to come hit them over the head with something, but you're here to to identify risk uh, and to help them uh, mitigate and, and to make things better. And you can, you continue to send that message, I think, at some point it and then you start to show on your actions. You're not trying to do that. It, it, you know, it starts to take take hold, and they recognize you're not here for the, <laughs> um, uh, you're not here to, you know, you know, throw them under the bus or anything like that. So, yeah, you're here to help and share a common goal of making the client successful. Really. Yep, yep, yep. And it's huge because you're trying to get that information, and if these folks don't feel comfortable with you, they're withholding information. And they're not, you know, not sharing data and reports and things like that. And you're hunting and pecking all over the place trying to find it, making your job less efficient. When, when you gain that trust, everything just seems to unfold and come out a lot easier. And, and that's a that's a that's a huge thing when you're doing this QA kind of process. So. Yeah, yeah, makes total sense. Well, I want to dive into that. Uh, some follow-up questions there, just around the challenges and some of the risks okay. of, the, of the project itself. Okay. Uh, okay. When we come back from a break, but we'll, we'll take a quick break first. I'm here with Tony Ford uh, talking about quality assurance on a Microsoft Dynamics 365 transformation. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with more transformation ground control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or 
download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. I'm here with Tony Ford. We're chatting about a large transformation effort and some of the lessons learned in our quality assurance role, helping a client through their transformation. Um, before we ju jump back into the questions, just a, a quick reminder that you can follow us on social media. Um, you can follow Third Stage on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can also subscribe to us on YouTube as well if you're not already subscribed there, watching us there. So. Tony, before the break, we were talking about some of the some of the challenges that this transformation has, um, or some of the challenges you've seen so far with this transformation. And a lot of, a lot of those points you made were sort of the the foundational structure of how, of how a team collaborates and how you deal with a multinational team and dealing with different time zones and cultures and things of that nature. Um, but what about the project itself? When you think about some of the uh, change management or business process or technology issues that you may be seeing so far, whether it's obvious issues or risks that are starting to uh, creep up below the surface? Yeah. What, what are some of those things you're seeing so far early in the project? Yeah, well, I think probably um, probably if, uh, there's a couple of categories of challenges that we, we started to notice as we got into the project. Um, uh, the the first area was just uh, the just the area of uh, of project management unto itself. Um, there there uh, there there was a there was the the style of project management uh, seemed to be a little bit how should I say this less rigorous. That's the word I was searching for. It was pretty apparent to me when I walked in the door after I'd spent some time here that some of the rigor. Uh, that was necessary for this is not this is a fairly complex implementation they've got a lot of moving parts um, uh, they've got multiple business units involved um, they got the uh, two through through two vent two pearly uh, different vendors working uh, so uh, there's a lot of constit and there's a lot of constituents uh, who are interested and in stakeholders who are interested in this process so um, my methodology, my approach, excuse me, uh, for project management has always been one of always, you know, start with the cookbook, um, your methodology being the cookbook, but then to adapt it to the circumstances. And sometimes the circumstances dictate, well, I don't need that kind of rigor. It's a less uh, complex project, uh, single implementation, that sort of, uh, you know, you adapt to it, but when you got more, you, when you're starting adding, you're adding more business units, more more perspectives, more applications, more vendors, uh, a lot of moving parts. Then you really have to have some rigor uh, in the process. And one of the first things that I noticed uh, right off the bat was that mm, um, the rigor was not. Uh, and when I say uh, I noticed, you know, the first thing we do, Eric, when we walk into these types of situations, is we. Um, we look for some key documents and then we start uh, looking for key elements that we would think would be associated with a fairly successful project management plan. And so we look for a project management plan, uh, which covers all the areas that wouldn't be uh, necessary to ma effectively manage a project. The other thing that we look for is a project management charter, a project charter. Um, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of times what happens is, uh, my, my experience has been with the more successful projects, you know, you don't overlook these, uh, these key startup elements, a, a, a management plan and a charter, because they lay the foundation for how decisions are made, um, uh, what tools we're using, what standards we're following, were the standard templates of, um, what deliverables, what deliverables are in the process, not just the contractual deliverables where at the end of phase, I need to get a sign off, but what are all the interim deliverables that are necessary to build up, uh, to maybe a phased, uh, uh, sign off where there may be contractual, uh, payments associated with, uh, a, a deliverable. So we walked in the door, we, you know, we started looking for those things and that charter is really, uh, important because it becomes the it becomes the Bible, if you will, for uh, keeping the project on course, 
Uh, it has the original expectations, the original business case, um, and, and it, in some ways it has the business case to project slash solution alignment so that you continue always, you have a benchmark to go back to to make sure that mm, what you're trying to deliver, you're still going in the direction of delivering to the value that the project is expected to deliver to. So um, uh, right off the bat, uh, we, you know, we discovered that some of those things were missing. And uh, one of the things I noticed too was that there was a lot of project management by presentation. Um, uh, we're looking, so, uh, you know, you're asking the questions, you're looking for artifacts, you're looking for, one of the first things I usually ask when I walk into a project is, so wh wh what's the, where's your pro your document management, the, your project document management uh, 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 do uh, document? Uh, and and uh, usually if that's there, it lays out everything pretty well so that I don't have to go all over the place looking for um, your templates, your your methodology, uh, uh, your deliverables, where things are and where, how things are being placed and where they're being, who's responsible for placing them there, are they secured, all the things that, that would kind of give me the roadmap to identify and find documentation so I don't have to go look for it. Um, uh, that was a, you know, that was my initial red flag that there was, there was some concern. And then, of course, when I didn't see the first two artifacts, there was another couple of more red flags. So I think the first thing was that the first thing I noticed here that there was some some issues and concerns around uh, uh, that. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we, we communicated that in that first stage gate, right, which is the project management review, uh, startup review. Um, and... Uh, we we insisted that we would to continue to monitor and to make sure that those things were in place. The second area uh, that was of concern was the actual uh, implementation approach. Uh, and the the way I'll characterize the implementation approach was that um, uh, there did not seem to be an approach that was iterative in nature, and it uh, it uh, required. Mm -mm, multiple iterations of uh, deliverable review confirmation, uh, if you will. And so there was this, there seemed to be this in their, in their, in their project plan and their approach, a big buildup to say an analysis and design deliverable sign off. And I got the impression, I've never seen the contract, the SOW, so I don't know for sure, but my gut, re my gut feel is that there are the milestones that have been identified in the project plan and, um, uh, are driving that are probably contractual uh, obligations where payments are to be received uh, and they're, li they're tied into payments. Um, so, you know, in a project this big, uh, iterative uh, uh, deliverables in confirmation will alleviate some of the pain around getting confirmation um, and understanding before we build up to this big bang kind of deliverable and that's kind of what the approach was it's a it's a big bang we're going to get to the design phase and we're going to we're going to have this big deliverable um uh, big set of deliverables so that was the first uh, concern that i have uh, the second concern i had was that there was some serious rework around their first the approach was to have one cr two crps in the beginning one for confirmation of requirements and a second one to confirm uh, confirm design which I thought was, you know, so the, their first, uh, the first thing I noticed was they combined analysis and design into one phase, which was with a big, with a big single deliverable of uh, a combined analysis requirements and design in, in a single deliverable, which one, it's a lengthy process, a long process to get to a huge deliverable that requires multiple levels of skill to evaluate for sign off. Uh, so those were some significant problems that I saw. Um, then the second thing that pretty, became fairly apparent was when they completed their CRP one, there were some struggles with taking the um, APQC models and using those for, to drive out requirements with the client uh, when the client was not very familiar with APQC uh, models, process models. So it turned into the client couldn't talk that language and so rather than the than the the system integrator saying we're going to build um, our understanding of the business based on something you're familiar with which may be your business processes and then we'll translate that into an apqc model uh they took they took the pot they took the path of taking the model 
and bringing it in and using it as a guide, in which it was a terrible guide. And they ended up reworking, having to uh, rework that whole exercise, which lost four weeks in the project. It's because they had to repeat the cycle because they were not, uh, they were not, um, they were not performing, getting the performance out of the process and moving forward. So that was the first, um, that was a real red, so another red flag. So um, my biggest issue so far has been with the lack of rigor in how project management has been done and the approach that doesn't seem to be an iterative approach that builds on the knowledge. And a, a case in point was um, um, the initial understanding of the scope of GAPS was that uh, the Microsoft D365 uh, application was a 100% fit, which that's another red flag for me too, because I've never seen an ERP, even the best of them, a 100% fit. So uh, uh, setting an expectation, and I'm not sure if the vendor, or the SI, or, or Microsoft were part of that process, but you know, usually if, if you're going through a software eval, you're going to have your first iteration of understanding of where um, uh, there are some fit gap uh, issues that have to be dealt with. And, uh, and so that, that never occurred. So I think there was a, a misleading expectation that there was a 100% with the application. And so, so because, again, because you're not having this iterative approach to understanding some of these things might come out a little faster if we had some a little bit more of um, uh, gather, uh, build some understanding, and get some level of confirmation. And so you're starting to see this kind of play out <clears throat> now because the difficulty right now is uh, they've uncovered over 200 gaps uh, and, and with a significant of them being um, potentially uh, custom software uh, resolved gaps. Um, and so this is kind of the process that we're in right now. And what we've uh, tried to suggest to them as an approach is to break up uh, the requirements gathering uh, separate from the design activities and push the design activities into the development cycle uh, so that we can get our hands around the full scope of the project by understanding the requirements gaps and high level solution options, uh, if you will, with maybe some relative uh, estimating of complexity. So we kind of know how complex uh, those things are. Uh, to get our, to get their to better get their hands around what the um, uh, what the scope change is going to be because you can see now there's going to be a significant scope change. So I think the biggest challenge right now is is getting them to get their hands around it and pushing design in, into the development cycle. I mean at least the detail more detailed design into the development cycle. So uh, it, it's pretty obvious that there's going to be a significant um, uh, re replanning around uh, the scope change. Uh, and so uh, by understanding that sooner rather than later, at least it gives them a chance to start uh, replanning. So that's kind of that's kind of the biggest issues right now. Yeah, and you hit a couple of really big ones there. I mean, with the project governance slash discipline slash implementation approach, I mean, just the whole, the whole program management, project management methodology, that whole piece of it. You touched on the the business process side of it with APQC, which for those of you that don't know, APQC is a uh, sort of a technology agnostic uh, business process best practice framework that you can use as a starting point to, to really flush out in more detail how you, how specifically your business processes work. Um, and then you also talked about the gaps, you know, some of the technological gaps between the software that was being deployed and what their actual needs were. And to your point, you're never going to have a perfect fit with with a, a new ERP solution, you hope to get as close as you can, but uh, whether or not 200 modifications or 200 gaps is, is uh, you know, a, a flaw in the evaluation process or not that, you know, we weren't involved in that, so we don't really know necessarily, but um, those, those are some pretty, you know, pretty common risks that we see with a lot of clients. What, what about on the, the change side or the people side? Are you seeing, is it, are we far enough along in the project yet, given that we're still, you know, we haven't gotten to the testing and all the, you know, where the rubber meets the road sort of parts of the project yet, but have there been any initial change management issues or some warning signs that you're seeing on the people side of the equation? I think the biggest issue on the people side from a change perspective, um, and uh, we, we haven't delved too much into that, but I, I, I could say at this point, a big part, a big concern is just an understanding of uh, how things are going to change. 
I get the impression uh, I have not been intimately involved in some of the sessions or even had some uh, some level of um, surveying, if you will, assessment of uh, uh, the potential impact uh, to the change. But you can see it's going to be fairly significant. Some of their business processes are going to change fairly significantly. So you can assume that there's going to be some level of and, and I don't have a good perspective yet of the maturity of the organization to some of the changes that are going to be coming uh, down the pipe. Um, you know, we're, we're going to try to get to some of that here real soon, but we, we, we just don't have that perspective. Uh, there's, it's been a little bit of a firefight at this point just to kind of help them get their hands around um, uh, the project and in, in, in some significant re- uh, re replanning around uh, the scope of work and how we approach it moving forward. I think once we kind of maybe get them to a point of, of feeling a little bit more comfortable in that area, we can maybe start to focus on some of the other areas. I can tell you too that some of the areas that seem to have some concern too are the data migration. Um, uh, the data migration is another you know area that seems to be lagging behind. Um, and I and I just you know I hate to really say this, but it just seemed like the I heard this actually I heard this this morning from uh, the CIO from our particular client that there seemed to be some na uh, uh, areas of naivety on the clients on the uh, the SI side, um, and so one of the other issues has been around uh, commitment level to the uh, resources and whether they have the right people or not. So there's a, there's a, this is one of those situations where there are some significant issues to overcome. Um, it's not that we can't do that and we can't help them get there, but um, some, of the some, uh, some of the challenges that I've had has been that I've had to maybe refocus a little bit of my effort where I, before is, you know, we had some dedicated hours to do some things and we've had to kind of uh, burn up a few more hours in a different area because there's a need to, to get the client, to help them right the ship in some places. So, Yeah. Yeah, which is the whole whole reason why they hired us and, and where our value is in this, in this case, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say at this point, the value, I, I see the value in that sort of thing. So, But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So based on what um, you've learned about the client so far, and again, I know it's early, and that's the whole purpose of having the conversation now is it's always fun to have these these sorts of case studies unpacked as they're happening rather than just you know sort of a postmortem after the fact. We can kind of get into you know the thick of things as they're happening, but as you look at the lessons so far, even though it's early in the project, what, what sort of lessons have come out of this project in particular that might be just sort of words of advice or wisdom to, yeah. to an organization or a team that's about to start on a transformation? What what would what advice would you give them as, as sort of a closing question here? Um, um, I think one is to make sure that you do your basic blocking and tackling, to use a football analogy, right? Um, uh, you know, it's an old cliche to say that, but uh, in this situation, uh, it's just making sure that we mm, mm, set up everything uh, in the beginning. Take the time uh, to put the right uh, checks and balances in place. Um, uh, make sure that you have a process uh, that is frequently reviewing um, and getting confirmation. ERP implementations by nature change. And you have to constantly be evaluating the change to make sure you understand how it's going to impact you uh, going forward. Um, the other thing, too, is to make sure that you have the tools in place that allow you to simulate uh, and model the change that is occurring so uh, you understand what's happening and where it's going long before it gets there. You don't want to be uh, or just in front of the change when it's occurring, you want to be able to say, "Okay, I understand what's about to happen," uh, and I'm not, we're, we're not going to freak out about it. It's just a, you know, it's just the nature of this type of implementation. Some things change, um, the business is changing rapidly. I mean, it's even so more so now than say maybe ten years ago. The businesses are changing rapidly, uh, and so given that, you, you could be in the midst of an implementation and the business changing rapidly is affecting where you may go with the implementation. Uh, you may alter uh, the priority of what goes live uh, and what goes maybe in go live two or go live three or what have you. But, you know, unless you have the tools in place to do that, you can't evaluate that. So I, I might, word of the wise, I guess, would be uh, make sure you put everything in place. Uh, take the time. Do the right project management. Project manager is a project killer if you don't do it right. 
uh, make sure you do all the necessary things to get things in place to manage effectively and get your dashboards in place so that you can predict better. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, make sure that you have an approach that, that uh, frequently reviews and confirms. And it doesn't mean you have to have all the answers at any one point in time. You build, you build, you build your answer. Uh, but to wait till you get to some huge, uh, long-term, big deliverable at the end of some phase, now we're going back to old traditional waterfall type of project, right? Where you're waiting till you get to the end of a project to say, I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do a checkpoint and go forward. Well, in today's world with the way things are changing, you can't wait that long anymore. Yeah, yeah, and it also delays the uncovering of risks or problems, you know, when you, when you have that uh, super long delay and, and wait to get the, the full deliverables in place. Absolutely. And these projects, you you know, they're big, they're changing. There's some there's some complex requirements. And so you got to be, you know, constantly reviewing and confirming. And at the end of the day, it's the customers, the client is going to tell you what's right for the business. You can't dictate, uh, you can't say I'm an integrator. I think I understand everything that's important to your business. I may understand uh, uh, multiple perspectives because I've got an industry experience, but I don't know the unique perspective of this particular customer and we have to recognize it and change with it. So, yeah, that's a great, great point. And in a great, you know, closing thought is that just because you have a system integrator, that's an expert in a particular type of software, whether it's Microsoft or Oracle, SAP, NetSuite, Workday, whatever it is, it doesn't mean they're good project managers. And it, and it's, it's sounds funny hearing that sometimes you think, well, what do you mean? They, I looked at the proposal and they've got a project manager on the project. You have to remember that a lot of these system integrators grew up in the world of building, you know, designing and building software, not necessarily complex program management. A lot of the stuff you're talking about is more program management, program governance, controls, methodologies, all that stuff that's, uh, you know, outside the realm of, of technology per se. So it's a, an important point that I yep. think a lot of people miss. In the, in it's the funny, and it, as, a, as a final comment, it's funny you should say that because uh, I just made the comment the other day that just because you come from uh, one of the large, even if you come from one of the large integrators like a KPMG or a Price Waterhouse or uh, Deloitte or somebody like that, it actually come. It always comes back down to you, that you. You may have the backing from those organizations, but it always comes down to the individual team and project management on site with the client and their abilities to do the work and to and to manage effectively. So don't trust that you you know you got a great organization behind you because sometimes the people that that get deployed aren't always uh, have the skill sets that are necessary. Yeah, don't trust trust but verify. Which um, good, <laughs> good uh, it really wraps. I mean, that sort of summarizes everything that we're doing for this client too. Is you know, I think they trust, but they're also asking us to trust but verify and you know identify some of the gaps and weaknesses right. and deficiencies in the overall approach and plan and and help them navigate those. So that's a good good feedback for us. Good. Well, thanks for uh, being on the show. This is really this is really helpful, and uh, hopefully, it's given our listeners some things to think about as they embark on their transformation journeys. And again, doesn't really matter if it's a D three sixty five or Microsoft type of transformation, or whether you're talking about SAP, Oracle, or any other technology out there. A lot of what you're talking about is completely agnostic, and uh, you know applies to any sort of transformation. So, I really appreciate your your feedback and help and right. time here, too, Tony. I, I appreciate you uh, uh, inviting me to the to the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. And uh, we're going to we're gonna take a quick break. Uh, thanks again for being here, Tony. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. Are you ready for transformation in 2021? Are you ready for change? Well, we want to help ensure that you're ready at Digital Stratosphere on April 20 through April 22nd. Digital Stratosphere is the only technology agnostic event of its kind and we're bringing it to you digitally. This unique event is intended for anyone about to go through any sort of transformation, whether it be a digital transformation or a business transformation. This event is going to cover topics from experts ranging from strategy, to planning, to program management, to change management, to technology, everything you need to know to make your transformation successful in 2021 and beyond. And if you're one of the over 1,000 people that attended one of our past Digital Stratosphere events, this one promises to be bigger, better, and even more stratospheric. And the best part is that because this event coincides with Third Stage's three-year anniversary, 
we're providing the first day of keynote sessions to you with no registration fee. And if you would like to attend all three days of the conference, we've provided deep discounts to celebrate our three-year anniversary. So bring your entire team to Digital Stratosphere and get ready for transformation. Back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Parisa Noble. Uh, Parisa, the, what did you think of this conversation with Tony and this whole case study on this, this transformation in Saudi Arabia that we just discussed? Yeah, well, this company sounds fascinating and this transformation sounds fascinating because they're it's so big. Like they're really implementing a change in every component of their organization from accounting to sales and everything in between. So I thought that was very interesting. And I think it's important to know why because it it highlights how everything is connected and it's a domino effect. He mentioned that they're going through tremendous growth, which is what was kind of the tipping point for this company to adopt a new uh, technology. And it's a result of the government wanting to develop more real estate, which I thought was just was interesting. It's all connected, right? But beyond that, you know, Microsoft Dynamics 365, from what I know, it sounds like it's a very, obviously it's in the title, but it's a very dynamic software and you can add on these different modules that speak to like what they're doing, accounting, their CRM, et cetera. Is that accurate? It's kind of like a bunch of different puzzle pieces that come together to make the full, the full entree, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And you know, most ERP systems have different modules and, and pieces that can tie together, but Microsoft in particular has gone out and acquired a bunch of these different technologies that they've now consolidated into, you know, one single D365 offering. So it's, it's a, both a blessing and a curse that it's, that it's dynamic, as you say, and it's a, it's a, it's a puzzle to, that gives you a lot of flexibility. So on one hand, the, the positive is that it is more, it's a more flexible technology than a lot that are out there. But we also see a lot of clients that get lost in that flexibility. It's almost uh, like it's a blessing and a curse at the same time because they, you know, they just can't decide how they want the technology to work because it can do so many different things. And you really have to have a clear vision of how you want to use it, you know, to be effective and to get it done on time, on budget and all that good stuff. Right. Yeah. Like a double edged sword in a sense. Yeah. So that's interesting. And I'm curious to learn more about third stages specific involvement because you guys I mean, we, we pretty much come in and can help either from inception to completion for a project, but it also sounds like based on this project, you can kind of take a objective approach looking in and just guide the client as well. So I'm interested to learn more about, you know, the quality assurance piece. It sounded like from what Tony was saying, you guys did are doing project health checks. So assessing how well the project team is doing, reporting directly to the steering committee um, and doing uh, what you call stage gates, which I thought was very interesting. So I'm, I'm interested to learn more about how dynamic third stage is in their consulting services, because up to this point, from what I've heard, it's been um, being all in with the client, helping them from the beginning to the end. Tell me a little bit more about this perspective and kind of the range of services uh, that we offer as consultants. Yeah, so so in an implementation like that, um, there's really two primary ways that we we help. I mean, one is the way you've described, which is more of a, and it's the way Tony described as as far as more of a advisor, more of a coach, more of a you know providing health checks along the way to make sure that we're identifying risks, providing a risk mitigation plan to help figure out how we're going to remediate those risks, and just overall guidance and recommendations. So that's one one way we help. And, and that's the way that we're helping this client that Tony was talking about. Other clients will say, Hey, you know, we want, we don't have the skill set in house to be able to, to manage this entire transformation. So will you sort of be an extension of our team and be the, the program manager? Um, so we provide more of a hands-on role in implementing different technologies as well. So it really just depends on what the client needs are. Um, I think the key thing here, and this actually segues into where we'll 
go here in a few minutes with our next guest is, you know, just making sure you have some sort of third party guidance on how to manage the system integrator. That that alone is probably your biggest cost, your, your biggest line item cost in a transformation is that system integrator. So how do you make better use of that that resource and make sure you're not overspending and being inefficient with how you how you um, leverage those those system integrator resources? So either way, either model will work to help to help mitigate that mitigate that and help navigate it. But it's uh it just depends on you know what your internal capabilities are, and then certainly either model whether you're you know whether you're hiring someone like third stage to do the the quality assurance more of the advisory role or the the hands-on program management, usually that leads to exposing other deficiencies in the project, things that aren't being addressed well or aren't being addressed at all. Things like change management or data migration, those are two really common ones, or business process improvement, organizational design, how are we going to design this organization for the future, Um, integration and architecture, you know, how do you tie together multiple systems? Those are examples of areas where typically system integrators don't do those things very well. Or in some cases, they don't do it at all. So that PM, the program management, and or the quality assurance role sometimes will evolve into filling in some of those gaps as well. So, um, you know, I guess dynamic is the right word for, you know, it just depends on what the client needs are and where the where the gaps are. And that's that's the role we typically pay, play. Right, right. That makes sense. And I think, you know, ultimately it comes down to project management too. And that's something Tony was talking a lot about specifically with this client is project management is the key to a successful transformation and it sounds like this client had to kind of take a step back reassess replan um, and look at you know are we managing this project like we should be and it sounds like that's where Tony's helping a lot is providing that guidance on maybe pivot here do this um, leading them in the right direction so let's talk a little bit about project management what would you say is the number one goal for a project management team. Obviously, you want to have a successful transformation, but more specifically, what would you say should be maybe like the one or two top priorities that a project management should keep at the forefront throughout a digital transformation? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, there's a few things. One is to you know make sure the project stays on track, on time, on budget, sort of the, call it the usual project management sort of capability. Um, the other part of it that a lot of project managers miss is to look beyond the technology beyond the technology work stream so in other words if this isn't you shouldn't view this project whatever this project is for you whatever the transformation is for you you shouldn't view that as a technology implementation it's it's much more than that it's a it's a transformation and if you implement technology and that's all you do and even if you do that really well the project's going to fail and the reason it's going to fail is not because the technology isn't there, because the technology doesn't work, but it's because the operations didn't integrate with the technology and vice versa. The organization and the technology aren't integrated and aligned, and the overall project isn't aligned with the overall strategy of, of the organization. So really getting that alignment across you know strategy, people, process, technology, um, that's the job of a project manager, and that's the sort of art of it that most I would say most project managers miss. They they myopically focus on the technology. Let's get the technology designed and built. We'll roll it out. We'll do some training, and we'll go on our merry way. Um, those are the projects that fail. And um, so I think a big lesson from a project management perspective is to really view things outside the lens of just technology, but also looking at change management, process improvement, strategy. And it really, you know, the best project managers are the ones that. I would argue have the broadest skill set, not the deepest, not the deepest in technology or any other area, but someone who can look at the big picture and manage and prioritize all the different pieces of a project like that. Right. And to go one step further, too, I think a lot of it would come down to communication, right? Because if you're if you're trying to get alignment across all these different aspects of your business from the different team to the executive team, uh, it all comes down to how the information is being relayed, right? So Mm -hmm. making sure that you're over communicating, if anything, uh, and making sure everybody's on the same page. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. Very true. Makes sense. So tell me about, you know, there's pitfalls to everything. There's best practices to everything. I'm curious to 
dive deeper into that on the project management side. So what would you say are the pitfalls or common pitfalls of, uh, you know, the day-to-day tasks of a project manager when it comes to a digital transformation project? Well, I think one of the big ones is just getting sucked down rabbit holes that are a time and money suck. You know, it's it just, you're spending too much time and money trying to fix the wrong problems. Um, so for example, you know, sometimes the technological complexity becomes overwhelming for project teams, not just the project manager, but the whole team. And so you end up sort of dropping everything else to go fix this, whatever the problem is and really tackle that one problem. But then you're neglecting, you know, how the operations are going to look, or you're neglecting the change management side of it. And, you know, probably the biggest challenge is that of all the things that you have to do to be successful in a transformation, the technology piece is the only part of it that is tangible. You know, it's the only thing you can see and touch and feel, and it's very clear whether or not it's working. So we as humans, you know, going back to the artificial intelligence thing, you know, humans versus, uh, you know, what the way a a robot might handle it um, is we as humans are going to gravitate toward fixing that problem because that is something we can see. We can see that the technology is broken or it doesn't work or the transaction isn't working. Um, but we don't see, or it's harder to see when a business process workflow is not working the way it should, or when it, when that's broken, or even, uh, more difficult is to understand when the change management issue is going to be a problem and the organizational dynamics are going to be a problem or, you know, roles and responsibilities haven't been well-defined and there's, there's going to, that's going to create chaos when we go live. So that's stuff we can't see and touch and feel, or it's stuff we can see and touch and feel, but we're not going to see it or recognize it till later when we go live, in which case it's too late, or at the very least, it's going to cost you a lot of time and money trying to fix it later rather than just getting it right up front. So I'd say that's probably the biggest challenge or pitfall that project managers face is just that difficulty in seeing those things outside of the, you know, the way technology is built, which is just a pretty, in the grand scheme of things, it's a pretty minor part of a transformation, ironically, because it's you know, we're talking digital transformation, we're talking about technology, but that's really is, you know, the least of the priorities when you, when it comes to how to make a transformation successful. Right. So, and then looking at the other end of that, what are the best practices when it comes to project management to help you avoid that situation? Sure. Well, one is to, uh, you know, certainly use, you know, traditional project management tools and methods, whether it's PMP sorts of tools uh, or PMI uh, sorts of tools or uh, methodologies that a software vendor might provide. You you have all these different tools that you can use, but I think making sure that you tailor it for the unique situation you're in is important. So that's, that's, that would be a best practice I would consider. Um, The other, even backing up even more is to look more strategically at, you know, how does this project align with our overall strategy? And what are the different parameters and guidelines we're going to use to manage this project to make sure that we keep it aligned with the strategy we're trying to accomplish? So, you know, you know, it comes down to priorities as an organization. If our priority is to drive efficiency and scale, you know, as an organization, then the project should be run differently than a project that is valuing flexibility and building a, you know, a unique culture for employees. Those are two very different sets of objectives or strategies and that they should look very different when you get to the transformation. But the problem is a lot of software vendors and system integrators have a kind of one size fits all methodology and approach that just slams technology in without considering, you know, what is it we're trying to accomplish as an organization? What are our priorities? So I think that alignment and keeping just keeping the project aligned with the overall strategy and the overall direction of the company is one of the other big best practices that project managers can learn from. Right. And I think a lot of that, too, plays into project governance, right? I mean, that's probably under the umbrella of being a good project manager is governing the project, making sure that the guardrails are up, you're keeping everybody on track um, as far as timeline goes, as far as who owns what, what responsibilities fall where. Uh, Tell me a little bit about the, the tools available to project managers for governing their project. I mean, we've talked high level about using your business case, the initial business case where you're outlining what is the strategy, what is the vision, kind of setting that foundation um, and and really what the end goal is as a means of governing a project. 
is there more than that that people can kind of revert back to um, more than just a business case? Or uh, tell me a little bit about how people can manage and measure their success when it comes to governance. Sure. Well, you know, certainly the business case is one of them. Um, having a clearly defined governance structure in general, decision making structure, and uh, knowing when to escalate things to you know either the steering committee or executive sponsor whatever it may be. And just having a clear process for that is important because a lot of times you, you waste a lot of time pointing, you know, wondering who's on first, you know, who's, who's going to make this decision. And you're, you're, you know, it could be a simple decision too. It could be as simple as how, how is a business process going to look in this new technology? Cause we have 10 different ways we could design the software. We need to pick one that's best for us. And a lot of times it, it people aren't clear on who, well, who's going to make that decision. Is it the project team? Is it the project manager? Is it the executive sponsor? And so that sort of stuff needs to be defined up front, that whole project governance and decision-making structure. Um, so that's one piece of it. Another is certainly the project plan itself, you know, making sure you, you, you track to that and you're modifying and letting that be a living, breathing document that you modify and use to anticipate any potential delays or bottlenecks in the project. Um, that's another one. Um, and then I'd say, you know, the, the risk management side, there's risk mitigation tools we use to, to identify to assess and identify risk. And that's a really important one because project managers, a lot of times manage to their plan, even if they've got good project governance, but they're sort of marching ahead into the fog and they can't see what's behind the fog and a risk management tool and an ability to anticipate those risks is really important because then you're not just walking into danger. You're, you're sort of anticipating that there's something on the horizon. We've got to navigate. Now let's figure out how to get around it. Um, but a lot of project managers are sort of marching ahead with their, you know, their PMI tools and their project plan and their project governance and the methodology and all that stuff, which is great. But what's even more important is being able to see those risks on the horizon to be able to navigate that. And that's, you know, risk, risk management isn't cool. It's not a, it's not something that people get excited about, but it's something that's really important with uh, making these projects successful. Right. And being able to anticipate what's to come and adjusting accordingly. Because if you, it sounds like from this experience too, with this client, if you act even a week late or two weeks late on something that could have been avoided and anticipated before, you're, you're losing a lot of valuable time and a lot of, um, you know, just wasting money. And it sounds like also the system integrators, they're just standing by and they're, you know, okay with it. They're just racking up the bill, right? So yeah. it's in well, the client's best interest. Yeah, and that's that's the unfortunate reality of of projects like these is that you the system integrators are actually benefiting when you are experiencing challenges. So they, they have an economic incentive, whether they admit it or not, or whether they actually act on this or not, the economic is, incentive is there. They they benefit if the project get sideways, if they need to add more resources to fix more problems, or if they need to spend more time than originally expected, they're benefiting, but, but you're not. So it's it's a sort of a perverse relationship from the start. And that's why, you know, having that risk mitigation and having that third pa- the third party quality assurance and the third party program management to help manage that and rein that in uh, is so important. Right. That makes sense. And then the other thing that stood out to me in the conversation was when Tony came to the table and kind of was looking at their software selection process and how they landed on Microsoft Dynamics 365. They listed MD365 as 100% fit, which I thought was interesting because it doesn't sound like there's such thing as 100% fit. No. <laughs> no, it's, no. Yeah. And especially yeah. a company like this, they're, they're a big company, well-known retailer. I wish I could say who they were because I'm pretty sure you know who they are and most listeners know who they are, but um, yeah, you, there's no system out there that's going to be hundred percent fit with this client or really any client for that matter. Right. What would you say is a realistic percentage fit? I mean, that's kind of hard to quantify, but if you had to guess and just kind of throw a number out there, what should companies kind of have an expectation on of, you know, best case scenario, if you pick the very best software for your organization, what's the gap that it'll fill if it's not going to be a hundred percent? Well, I, so that's a good question. First of all, it's it's important to get out of the mindset of quantifying it in a way that's either it's a fit or it's not. You know, because it, so it's not. In other words, it's not that it's um, you know eighty percent of your requirements are being met by this system. 
usually it's okay 80 percent are being met by this system in some way it may not be perfect but even within a specific requirement you have it's usually not yes no it's usually you know on a scale of one to five you know this product is sort of a four out of five in terms of its level fit this one over here might be a two out of five so they both do it technically they both can accommodate that requirement but one of them does it a lot better than the other or at least in a way that's a better fit for our needs so that's the first thing is when you think about quantifying what percent fit it is you have to think about each individual requirement not as a yes no and then quantify what percentage but on a scale or a continuum how well do they fit so with that you know with that sort of math in mind i'd say that if you can get a system that gets you call it anywhere from 70 to 80 percent of what what you need or want then that's that's pretty good um you might get 90 percent if you're lucky if you're if you're a smaller or a little bit more vanilla sort of organization without you know super complex or unique needs you might get higher you're, you're, not, you're still not going to get to 100 percent you might be able to live with whatever the system does you might be able to adapt to it but it's not ever going to be 100 percent fit so you know i think if you get in that 70 to 80 percent range that's pretty good but having said that just because you're in the 78 to 80 percent range doesn't mean you're out of the woods it means you've got to figure out what you're going to do about that other 20 percent because that other 20 percent is what's going to create problems and delays not to say you need to switch the system or or rethink what system you're deploying necessarily but it does mean you need to rethink how you're implementing it because there's risk there that you've got to identify or navigate right that's super fascinating i'm curious to hear how it lands for this client and how microsoft dynamics delivers yeah yeah absolutely us too i'm excited to have them as a client and uh look forward to continuing the journey with them so you know one thing that uh, we did talk about in the interview with tony was the whole idea of you know managing the system integrator and how the system system integrator fits into the overall transformation and that's a good segue into our next guest who we're going to bring on right after a break who's bonnie tinder she's the ceo of a company called raven intel which uh, provides customer reviews for different system integrators out there and it's a good uh, resource for evaluating potential system integrators so we're going to bring bonnie on after we take a quick break you're listening to transformation ground control we'll be right back feeling good. hey feeling good like i should when in the walk around if you are aiming for transformation success turn to third stage consulting group Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello and welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Brisa Noble. Uh, our next guest I'm excited for, uh, she's someone I've known now for a few years, sort of a innovator and disruptor in the industry, which I, I like to consider third stage, a innovator and, disrupt and a disruptor in the transformation space as well. And so uh, have a really good um, connection with this organization and, and an interesting business model they have uh, that's sort of disrupting the industry and disrupting the space. And essentially what uh, Raven Intel is, is it's an organization or a website that provides uh, peer reviews, customer reviews, actual verified reviews of system integrators. So if you're looking for HCM or ERP or CRM uh, sorts of system integrators for whatever technology you're considering, it's a great source for looking at actual reviews, quantitative and qualitative for different system integrators out there. So what I want to do today is bring on Bonnie to talk about not only what the website does and what some of the resources are available to people out there, but also more importantly, to find out what are some of the trends that she's seeing in the data. Um, now, I don't think she used artificial intelligence, bring it back full circle, back to the artificial intelligence thing. I think she actually, you know, analyzed it as a, as a human, but someday, you know, she might've been able to use uh, artificial intelligence to, uh, to analyze some of this data, but she's got some great lessons on, on how to 
manage the system integrators and what some of the things are you should be looking for as you evaluate system integrators. So with that, we'll bring Bonnie onto the show. Bonnie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to talk. Yeah, this is a great topic and in, in, uh, in, in insur- or an area that I know is of interest to you and uh, your whole business is built on this this concept of, of system integrators and evaluating system integrators and how do you compare different resellers and integrators. But I guess before we jump into the, the, the meat of the conversation, maybe just tell us a little bit about Raven Intel and what you guys do. Well, I'm, I'm Bonnie Tinder. I'm the founder and CEO of Raven Intel. Uh, And we're a peer review company, so very much like Yelp or Glassdoor, Um, but the reviews that we have and we collect are about enterprise software projects um, and implementations and the the SI partners who actually complete them. So at our core, we are all about helping uh, an enterprise software customer make a great choice in a consulting partner and, and really know all of the options that they have available. Um, I founded the company uh, about three years ago after being in the HR tech space for the past 25 years. Um, And my job, I I run the business and our team and really work to ensure that our visitors um, have a a valuable and trustworthy um, sort of place they can go for information about projects. Uh, In ravenintel.com, we have over a thousand reviews on projects completed all around the world um, by about 200 different consulting firms um, and seven main types of enterprise software. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we do. Okay, great. So it's, uh, I like how you described it as the Yelp of, of the industry as far as finding a, a system integrator. Um, and it, exactly. What I really like about your your business and just the whole idea of Raven Intel is that it's, it's somewhat of a disruption in a good way. It's a disruption that that brings transparency and um, information in a way that buyers of system integrator and software vendor services didn't have before. So how have system integrators and software vendors and others in the industry that typically want to push, you know, their narrative or their version of, you know, what their strengths are, how have they responded to this, call it disruption to the industry? Yeah. Um, well, you're right. It, you know, this idea of transparency is something that um, not everybody loves. Um, so I'm going to ask answer that question in, in two parts, really. So, um, really, the, re- the the reason I started Raven over three years ago was I wanted customers to be able to independently make a, a great choice in, in consulting partner and know what the experience of their peers have been um, previous to. Um, you know, in, in previous situations. And so, you know, from the customer perspective, customers love this. Um, you know, nobody likes implementation. It's challenging, it's expensive. And I guess what I wanted to do is, is help, you know, make that suck less for customers. And, you know, what I saw in my experience was, you know, that so much of the the time customers didn't know what they didn't know before they got into an implementation. And um, I think the idea of selecting the best SI partner was really minimized. I mean, customers don't factor that in as much, you know, as as important of the decision as making the right software decision. And it really is because if implementation doesn't go well, the chances are the rest of your software experience is, is going to be poor as well. So, so the second part to the question, you know, that I'll answer is, is you know, how do SIs and software vendors like this concept of, of Raven and, and transparency and peer reviews? So I would say too, um, it's mixed. There are, you know, what I would say is, is the best SIs and the best software vendors like it because it's this way that they can, um, really get the voice of their customer out about how well implementations are and showcase their work. So we have SIs that use this as sort of a a way to get known uh, to customers that might not have known about them either through the lens of of successful project delivery. And I say, you know, those, those SIs that run to this concept of let me get my customers um, experience sort of amplified those are the ones that you want to partner. And then I would say that there's some others that are lukewarm about it or flat out just 
don't like it. Um, and those are probably the ones that might have some skeletons in the closet, quite honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like people in the industry, when they see the information, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, that's a stronger, more compelling message or data point than just hearing all positives. I mean, I think in some ways people want to hear, you know, even if it's a great SI with a great rating on your site, I would imagine they still want to know, you know, what were some of the downfalls or what some of the challenges you, you face because every, like you said, they, every implementation sucks and this is a way to hopefully make it suck a little bit less. Right. Right. And we're not a testimonial site either. We were, we are a true peer review site. And, um, you know, I, I think that the idea that every single project is, you know, is a five star, you know, amazing delivery. Um, I mean, that, that's just not reality. And so I, I really do feel like customers want to know, um, sort of the good and what the challenges are and the best SIs do not have all perfect projects. Nobody does. On the other hand, you can see patterns with the best eyes, SIs that make sure that, hey, even though a project has some challenges, they are able to bring it back around and, and satisfy the customer in the end. So speaking of patterns, what, what are some of the patterns or trends you're seeing in the overall system and integrator space in general? And I, I would be curious to hear in particular if, you know, I'm sure there's some general trends you're seeing over the years that you've been uh, doing this. But more specifically, in the last year or since COVID, you know, I, I'd be curious to hear if there's anything within that as far as things that have changed or patterns you're seeing with people's overall perceptions of system integrators. But what are some of those general trends you're seeing? Yeah. So, um, you know, 2020 as a look back was a was an was an interesting year, um, and it was challenging for projects because it accelerated many transformation efforts. Um, you know, in, in specific industries. So we saw a, a high degree or a high volume of projects in government, education, um, and, you know, some areas of manufacturing, but it hobbled projects or stalled them in almost every other industry. So in general, what we saw um, was 48% of projects that were done in uh, 2020. 48% of them had a scope change while in flight. And by scope change, that means either the project got um, narrowed down to like, let's say just certain geographies, or it you know, was uh, done more in a phased approach. Um, in some cases, the scope changed because they added more um, functionality or different functionality due to the fact that you know they needed to accommodate for a large portion of their employee base working at home. So 48% of the time, customers had a change that they didn't anticipate. We also saw a higher volume of phase two projects or what um, you know, we call like either optimization projects or additional module add-ons. So I think what this tells us is that customers said last year, hey, I'm not gonna switch my entire system over um, just yet, I want to keep with what I have, but make sure it has this certain functionality um, that I can roll out, you know, sort of quickly. So more uh, phase two projects. And, and this is the, the kind of silver lining in 2020 is that the actual delivery and satisfaction in projects went up. So satisfaction um, in years past was typically a seven out of 10. Um, in terms of you know how how well do you how how satisfied were you with this particular project? You know hovers around the sevens. Um, in years past, last year it was in the eights, which is is good. So I think customers gave SIs and and their software vendors the benefit of the doubt there in terms of or were, were a little bit more um, forgiving of, of lots of these changes, and they had customers had their own changes internally too. So satisfaction was high, but then also we actually saw a 10% increase in delivery on time and on budget um, factors. So this could be due to the fact that projects were a little bit smaller in nature, um, but you know it's never a bad thing to have these projects come in more on time and on budget than in the past. So um, those were the, the themes there. I think in general in 2020, flexibility and customers wanted to wanted their software vendor as well as their SI to be flexible. 
and gave them extra credit in terms of overall points when they felt that they were being flexible or adaptive to the changes that that they had internally so that's that's sort of the trends that we saw in 2020 um eric before you and i even started this call we talked about how now 2021 we're seeing an uptick in projects just in general um and i think there was a lot of pent-up demand or you know people feel that you know 2021 i'm more optimistic that um you know this this new normal is here and and we can adapt and start spending again so uh 2021 i think is going to be a good year yeah yeah definitely it's i like i like the uh the optimism for for the new year i think a lot of us are, are looking for that after after the way 2020 was um yeah for sure so the so that's interesting what you're saying about the the on time uh, on budget percentages going up you know in a, in a positive direction do you think any of that has to do with the fact that it, it, do do customers have an um, easier time managing system integrators and maybe, you know, having transparency into what they're doing when there's this remote delivery model? Or, or do you think that has anything to do with it at all? You know, I think the remote delivery model um, accelerated the or, or minimized the number of what I would consider superfluous meetings. You know, one of the huge complaints I've heard from customers is like, we have status meetings about our status meetings. And I think now without, you know, where there's more intentionality about, you know, having these calls, um, you know, reg the regular calls, um, you know, there's a, a more of a box put around, you know, even a meeting, you know, the way meetings are managed versus you know we're all sitting in a conference room together we can you know there was a lot of i think wasted time and wasted time uh, travel and expenses and things like that because of all of the um you just kind of interpersonal re interactions that don't necessarily contribute to project delivery strength so i think we got more efficient with the way that we met last year um, didn't have as many, um, what I would consider, you know, meetings that didn't, unproductive meetings, because people were a little bit more specific about here's the agenda, this is what the time frame is, and we're, you know, we're going to make sure that we check off our lists, you know, lists, and then, you know, reconvene um, once everybody's completed these type of things, as opposed to, you know, let's just meet and, you know, might have a, an extra hour or two in there that that really didn't lead to anything yeah super interesting and you know if you would have told me those data points in isolation that the you know the overall on time and on budget rate had increased i would suspect or i would have assumed that that must mean the satisfaction level dropped or maybe yeah you're spending less time and money but you're probably getting less value out of the implementation but what you're saying is that number has gone up as well so people are not only spending less time and money but they're getting you know they're more satisfied at the end of the day. And I, I think you mentioned that they might be giving SIs a bit of a free pass in some ways, but what do you, you know, what do you attribute that to, or do you have any, you know, root cause understanding of why, you know, how that, how that is, you know, what is it that they're more satisfied about, or how is it that they're happier with their SIs at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like last year, many SIs um, and many software vendors tried to go the extra mile with flexibility to accommodate for the needs of clients. And that, that flexibility was where I saw customers really being appreciative of the services provided by SIs. The other thing a lot of SIs did was provide free, um, you know, either uh, free consultation or free sort of products, value added sort of things to manage certain things, um, you know, that, that they could give to customers that might have been in need. So I think those type of, you know, heroic efforts and, and the SIs that want the extra mile, I think customers are gonna remember that and they're gonna be the heroes this year as well with extra business or maintaining those relationships because, you know, they sort of weathered through the, the tough times um, and showed themselves, you know, to be a real partner. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. So, so it could have a lot to do with the relationship and the, um, you know, the types of things that the SIs are doing for, for their customers. 
do you think that that is necessarily translating into more successful projects as well? They might feel, so in other words, do customers feel better about the relationship and the things that the SIs are doing and, and getting the results they expect at, you know, at go live and post go live and that sort of thing, or what are your thoughts there? You know, I think it's a little bit too soon to tell, you know, whether last year is now going to be the litmus test for, you know, successful delivery this year. I think though, there's a lot of areas of efficiency that both customers and SIs sort of found through so much remote uh, and distributed work, um, you know, how should I say, hacks that happened last year that I think that, you know, we might see more, those same efficiencies being brought in 2021, even after, um, you know, everybody's back to traveling again or back in the office and, and having face-to-face -face interactions. Um, you know, I, I think that there's been a, a lot of silver linings in terms of here's efficiencies that we can we can lean back on um, for the future. Sure, sure, that's interesting. Well, we're gonna take a quick break and when we come back, I'm gonna ask you some follow-up questions about uh, more specifically around the challenges of, of working with some of the SIs and some of the things you're seeing there. And perhaps most importantly, I, I wanna ask you some questions about how to find the, the best SI um, just based on your experience and some of the information on your site. So we're here with Bonnie Tinder from Raven Intel. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control and we'll be right back. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, Contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Okay, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control where you can find us live every Wednesday on YouTube at 10 a.m. Eastern Time in the U.S., uh, 3 p.m. London, and 11 p.m. Hong Kong. You can also subscribe to us on Apple, Google, Spotify, Pandora, wherever you listen to podcasts. So I'm here with Bonnie Tinder from Raven Intel, and we're talking about system integrators and just some of the, the data and the customer reviews that uh, and data that she tracks on her website, Raven Intel. And we were talking about uh, levels of satisfaction and just overall results of some of these system integrator uh, customer experiences. And we were talking about how, you know, more projects are finishing on time on budget. Uh, there's a higher satisfaction level since the pandemic started. Um, but I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the challenges that people experience with system integrators just in, in general. Um, and before I get to that, maybe and talk about some of those specific challenges. One thing I'm curious about, and I, th I think a lot of people that we work with are curious about is, you know, is there a correlation or do you see a correla correlation between the customer reviews and the overall ratings and scores of system integrators and the type of system integrator? So in other words, do big system integrators have higher or lower scores on average than the small ones or do the, you know, the niche focused ones have higher or lower scores than, than the uh, other ones? Or do, do you see any patterns like that in the, the data you've analyzed so far? Yeah, you know, I will tell you that um, we see no correlation between hiring a big five firm with a name brand um, and the success of a project. In fact, um, you know, what I would say is, is in general, independent firms um, that let's say have between 25 and 100 professional services staff who specialize in a certain either functional area like HR or product line um, tend to be rated higher than management consulting firms who have a software implementation or project um, arm. And um, you know, while there's, you know, some people consider that a safe bet, a lot of people consider it a safe bet. I never got fired for hiring, you know, big firm, you know, X here. Um, you know, as 
you know, that that's going to be sort of the, the safety net, there really isn't a correlation between that and project success. And that's based on over a thousand reviews that we've had um, looking at both, you know, big five or big six independent versus what I would consider like small boutique. Um, with that said, though, with the independence, it's difficult to know, okay, they don't have a name brand. Should I just trust what they're telling me? Or, you know, how much can I trust that this, you know, independent brand is going to be able to deliver on say, what they say? So there's a lot of due diligence that is um, really necessary to find the best firm for your project. And, you know, there's going to be times if you are in enormous global company that has a footprint and you want ground level um, you know, resources in, you know, some place in, in North Europe or something like that, there's going to be very few firms that, that do that. And so, you know, in those cases, that's like, that's going to lend itself to, you know, a big five, let's say, but if your project is like 80% of them, where it's maybe regional, you're in the, um, you know, just mid-size enterprise space, you don't necessarily have to go with the big firm, there's probably plenty of others that uh, can do a great job. You just need to vet them appropriately. Um, you know, the other thing I will say, and this is, um, you know, one of the pitfalls is, you know, software vendors uh, will recommend one or two partner firms to you during the selection process or, you know, like, or during your, uh, your software selection. Um, and I would say it's really important to go beyond that. Don't just take those two and say, all right, I'm going to pick one of these. You really want to make sure that you're in the driver's seat in terms of vetting that SI because that implementation partner is going to make or break your success and your software vendor, while they, um, they definitely do business with a lot of firms they don't necessarily know the best partner for you either. They're gonna recommend the one or two based on their sort of limited knowledge in your region, things like that, when there might be a better one out there that can get you a better value um, should you just sort of expand your, your, your search a little bit. And that's, I mean, that's really why Raven Intel exists is to give you that more complete list of options. So. Um, you know, again, it, it's hard to just take a broad brush and say, hey, you should hire an independent versus the big five or six or even a boutique firm. It really depends on the scope of your project and, um, you know, the, the, the type of, of software that you're going to be using um, that will really help, you know, sort of narrow your choices down there. Um, so that's a interesting point. And I, and I don't know about you, but I think a lot of system integrators are somewhat culpable too, because I think they, you, you mentioned the land and expand and the overall proposal, call it the sales and proposal misalignment uh, that happens as far as misaligned expectations. I think they come in with a, a, a plan, for example, that says, you know, we can do this in 18 months, let's just say as, a, as an example, and they staff it with, you know, 20 people for 18 months is kind of the assumption. But what happens when they find out that actually it's more like 24 months or, you know, 30 months, it's more realistic for this particular company because of, you know, whatever magnitude of change, change management, whatever it may be. But the problem is they've staffed it, you know, at that higher level, assuming a shorter duration, but they never really adjust for the fact that now you've extended the timeline and that's how the, the cost overrun seem to happen a lot. Is that something you see, you know, in the data or the reviews? Without a doubt, without a doubt. And, you know, I think that brings, uh, me to a, another point that I think is really important is, is make sure that you read the statement of work and everybody on the team internally reads that statement of work. So everybody understands, hey, we got these guys for 18 months. That's what the box is. So as soon as we start moving out the timeline because you know, we couldn't get something internally approved or we didn't, it was, it was our sort of issue that is causing a delay here. You want to make sure that then everybody understands what those downstream impacts are at, because, you know, the SI isn't necessarily going to surface those right away. Um, you know, and some delay that you think might be inconsequential 
might end up costing you a lot on the back end. So you want to make sure that your project lead and and of course your executives who sign off on the you know the the actual capital investment here understand what that statement of work is but everybody on the team understands what the timelines are as well and what um repercussions are going to happen when you start moving things out yeah yeah absolutely and i think that's where a lot of companies get in trouble because they don't do that piece of it that you you just described there um now you talked a little bit earlier about, um, you know, as we navigate some of the challenges that um, some or all of the SIs have, and and you know certainly no system integrator is perfect, and every organization has its its strengths and weaknesses. But at the end of the day, organizations go out there, including doing research on your site, to find information to help them evaluate and compare different system integrators. Um, and one one thing I want to come back to is is uh, I want to ask you questions about. Um, you know, what recommendations you have for how to evaluate potential system integrators. But one point you made earlier that was really important is that a lot of times people think, well, when I evaluate system integrators, if I know I'm implementing SAP or Oracle or Workday or whatever it is, I'll just go ask SAP or Oracle or Workday or whoever, who the best SI is for me. And I think it's, you made a really good point that I, I think is worth noting here when you're, when you're evaluating SIs, that's, that's a good data point to ask the vendors who they would recommend, but you have to take it with a grain of salt, like you said, because they, it may be limited just based on the information they have or the limited experience they have with these different SIs, but there's also the SI or the um, the economic uh, factor that goes into play here, which is you know certain vendors like certain SIs because they make more money off it or they know that that SI has a higher likelihood of selling you software and selling you more software, which is what the, the software vendor wants. So I think you know that's another you know an important bias that is important to recognize in the in the marketplace when you're evaluating. Uh, potential SIs. But beyond that, then, so if we, we get our list of potential SIs from, uh, from the vendors, we might ask some peers or others out there in the space who are some good SIs in the space. At some point, we've got to compare and contrast and figure out who the best fit is for us. What, what sort of criteria would you use that project teams use when they, when they evaluate potential SIs and the potential fit with their organization? Mm -hmm. I think first and foremost is, is can, this SI handle work like mine. So have they done other projects in my industry with the scope of my project in the same geography and what are other customers saying? As you said before, Eric, um, you know, you can, you can ask and, and things like that and get references individually from the, you know, your software vendor or from the SI themselves. Um, but that's a very limited range and it's limited by time. It's limited by geography. Um, and you know, Raven really gives that bird's eye view. And I have seen SIs who are great one year because they have a solid team. And then all of a sudden they lose half their team. And the next year, all of a sudden they really start to slip and the quality of project slips. So you want to make sure that you have the most current referenceable information. And that's really what the, the site is designed to do. And it's designed to be a proof point to what your SI is telling you during the sales process as well. You know, an SI is different than a software demo because they're not demoing you a piece of software. You can't objectively say, hey, yeah, I like that. That feature and function is going to match with our, uh, what I'm going to do. An SI is selling you on the quality of their people, really. And the only way for you to really understand it, are, it, are, and vet, is this what they are, is what they're saying true, is to talk to other customers who have gone through the process. So those independent um, proof points are really big, uh, which you can find out on Raven. I think the other, the other thing that's incredibly important is, you know, as I mentioned before, they're not, an SI is not demonstrating a, a product a piece of software. They're demonstrating their people who are going to be, um, assigned to your account to, you know, to work with you throughout the duration of a project. So you want to know, do I like this team? Do I feel this team can actually do the work? Am I comfortable with the personas and the backgrounds that these people have? So who am I getting introduced to during the sales process? And is that same team going to be who they assign me on the back end? Because one of the tricks of the trade is, is 
you know, SIs will bring in their A team during the sales process, but then assign you to the B team once you have actually signed um, your contract. And so you want to make sure that the same team that they're proposing during the sales process is who will you'll be assigned with, because that that culture that you're buying, um, you know, during the selection process is you want to make sure that that's the culture that they're going to deliver on on the contract side. So that's number two. Number three. Does this firm understand my needs and have they demonstrated this in the statement of work? If you get somebody who is rushing you through a process, giving you a quote before they truly understand um, what the scope of the project is, your time frame, your people, all of those type of things, um, they're typically going to fall into the camp of land and expand where we're going to give them a low price, low ball price, get in there until it's too late for you to switch us out and then we're gonna charge you extra later on. So don't go necessarily with the lowest price proposal. Um, go with the one that you feel really understands your needs because in the long run, even though that might be a little bit more expensive upfront, it'll end up costing you less than the guys who will come in, give you a cheap price and then you know, pad that contract you know, two and three times with change orders. So those would be my three. Yeah. Okay. And then what about after you've, you've selected that ideal fit system integrator, um, then, you know, you're not out of the woods yet. You still have to manage the relationship, make sure the implementation overall goes well and, and take ownership of the implementation. So what are the things that customers can do to, to manage that relationship and just to, to manage the SIs longer term through the implementation? Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier read the statement of work, have your entire team read the statement of work and know what is and is not included in the project sc scope because surprises are the worst. Um, and you want to, you know, sort of be operating on a very clear picture of what your start and end dates are and then all of the dependencies, you know, that um, throughout the project are, are gonna make sure that you're gonna hit or, or miss those, those dates. So using a project management tool, I think, and systematically managing your project, that's also um, a really good way to, to keep yourselves internally aligned um, as well. And so that would be the, the first one is, 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 you know, once you've confidently made that decision in an SI, be all in, but read the statement of work and make sure that your entire team does the same so that nobody, nobody has any surprises going going in. And then, you know, what I would say is, is, um, you know, and, and both of us mentioned this before, don't go with the first or second partner your software vendor recommends, make sure that you're doing an independent search that really puts you in the driver's seat. Because if your project goes off the rails, you know, your software vendor is, you know, gonna, you know, be, be upset about that. But at the end of the day, it's your project. So, you know, they're, 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 there's not a lot of skin in the game for them versus you who's really paying for it and making sure that, you know, that, that you're confidently going and knowing that you've made the best choice possible in that SI. So those would be the, the two things that I would say. Okay, great. Yeah, that's uh, super helpful. Now, if, if I'm a organization that has worked with one of these system integrators in the past or worked with a system integrator in the past, or I'm currently working with one, how do I submit a review? Why would I do it? What's in it for me? But what advice would you have there? Absolutely. So if you are a customer that's looking for a partner, ravenintel.com, you can come and, and search and read all of our reviews for free um, out there and, and see who the, might, the best partner might be for your project. We'll even help you if you need a short list. Um, if you have gone through a project and you want to help your peers understand that you loved your SI and all the great things that they did for them, or that you would not recommend your SI and warn uh, other customers about getting um, in, our platform gives you a voice to do that. And you can write a review within four minutes or less. It's anonymous. We vet that and we'll make sure that we were checking it out and you know contacting you to make sure it's, it's legitimate. But um, in four minutes, you can do this very easily. And the help that you provide your peers is exponential because really it, our site depends on 
um, the, the sh customer sharing their experience and, and we make it really easy for a customer to do that. And um, we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll absolutely um, take that information and, and keep your, uh, in, in your own personal information confidential, but it will be used to, to help others uh, prepare for their projects. Good. Well, I, I, I think that's a, a good place to leave it. And I appreciate you being on, on the show here today, Bonnie. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, look forward to maybe talking again in 2022 and, and seeing how this year went. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more on transformation ground control. We'll debrief and cover a, a few of the points that, that Bonnie had here uh, for us today. Um, and we'll be right back after a quick break. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Parisa Noble. Uh, Parisa, we just had the conversation with Bonnie Tinder from Raven Intel. What what are some of your thoughts or observations? Have, have you heard of Raven Intel, first of all? Is that something you're familiar with? No, I haven't. But what an awesome resource. I mean, the most important thing, I mean, even when you look at Google reviews just on your favorite restaurant or, you know, product, it brings so much transparency. And this space needs the most transparency. I mean, it's not a small investment that these companies are making into an ERP implementation, right? So, so having that, you know, completely raw review that you can look at of people who were in your shoes, I think that just sets the tone. So hats off to Bonnie and her team for doing what they're doing. One thing that, you know, I thought would be worth talking about because it, it sparked a question in my mind is it sounds like there are just, there's a lot of players when you look at a transformation project. There's the system integrators, software vendors, third-party consultants, you know, the client. So tell me about all the players that, you know, could be a part of a transformation project. What do they do? What does a system integrator do versus, you know, the actual software vendor? Are they the same thing? Are they different? Yeah. What are we looking at here? <laughs> so it, a lot of it depends on the, on the software we're talking about. If you're talking about um, certain systems, like uh, for example, Microsoft Dynamics, we were, we were talking about Dynamics 365 earlier in the show when we had Tony Ford on. And uh, you know, with Dynamics, Microsoft doesn't really do much in the way of implementations themselves. They almost solely rely on third party resellers and system integrators to do the implementations. Other vendors like, um, trying to think of examples here, um, I know Epic, it, this used to be true for Epicor, but it's not anymore. You know, Epicor used to do most of their implementations themselves. Um, and it was it was hard to find a third party provider at the time to, to do that. And that, that's still the case for a lot of the smaller, uh, more niche software vendors is they, they do the implementations themselves and they don't really have much, if any, you know, third party support, which is good and bad. It's sort of limiting in some ways because you don't have as many options, but in, in other ways, you know, at least you're getting direct access to the, to the direct vendor. Um, and then other, you know, other vendors, most vendors I'd say have a, have a hybrid model. You could use their direct professional services like SAP, for example, has their own professional services group as does Oracle and many others. But within SAP and Oracle, for example, you also have, you know, hundreds or thousands of potential SIs out there, resellers uh, throughout the world. So it really just depends. I mean, you know, this, at the end of the day, though, either way, the software vendor is providing the technology itself, the subscriptions and the uh, the ongoing support, you know, from a technical perspective. And then the system integrator typically will do the uh, the functional technical uh, design and build of the software. Um, and then, but I think that the important thing to note, though, is that between vendor and system integrator, you're not 
you don't have everything covered. There's a lot more that needs to happen that either you need to do yourself or you need to hire, you know, third party support for. So things like, you know, the program management or quality assurance is one thing we talked about earlier with Tony um, as one example. The change management is another example. Uh, data migration is oftentimes, you know, requires additional resources. So you really have to look at, you know, what can that system integrator realistically do? What are they good at? What's their sweet spot? And what's left, you know, and, and make sure you look at all the other stuff because a system integrator will kind of sell themselves as a, you know, single throat to choke or a single, you know, one-stop shop, but that's rarely the reality of what these system integrators can provide. Got it. So do these system integrators provide, you know, can they implement various softwares or are they usually married to one software vendor? Um, so the bigger ones, you know, when you get into the Accentures and Deloitte's of the world, they typically will have multiple practices. Um, they're typically focused on a small handful of the, of the biggest, you know, ERP providers. Um, but most, I'd say most resellers and most system integrators are focused exclusively on one, maybe two uh, different technologies. Got it. Got it. And they're the ones, so say you wanted to do customizations on the software. They're the ones that would help you code that. Yeah. Absolutely. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. That helps. That makes a lot of sense. So then, you know, our team is more so kind of bringing that full scope view um, and, you know, other agencies like ours, but there's other agencies like ours that don't take that technology agnostic approach. And you have, you know, you have a lot of, you, it's a clouded industry, no pun intended, <laughs> right? If you look at all the different influences that play into a client making their selection on which software they should use. I mean, you have a lot of third state, I mean, third party consultants coming in that are biased and are kind of getting paid off to recommend specific uh, softwares. So I guess, and we've talked about this in a lot of our other content, our blogs, you have a couple videos about, you know, how deep it goes and how um, foggy the lens can, can get when you're looking at, you know, is this, recommendation I'm getting from this consultant out of truly they recommend it because it's a good fit for my company or are they going to get a commission from the software vendor or the software integra integrator right so how can companies see through the fog how can you kind of wipe the glass and um, make sure that you're getting a holistic recommendation um, when you're looking at the software selection process obviously using Raven Intel would be helpful, but what other ways uh, can we get past that? Well, I think the, the, the main thing to do is two things really. One is to keep a open mind and, and take the sales and marketing messaging from software vendors and system integrators with, with a grain of salt. And, and you know, when I say that, I mean that just recognize that they're, they're trying to sell you. They're, they're positioning the positives, they're positioning the, the upside, um, they're positioning all the strengths which isn't a bad thing. I mean, that's their job, right? They're trying to sell software. They're trying to sell their services, but you just have to recognize that you're being sold to. So, you know, recognize that there's probably a blind spot there. There's a bias and you're, you're not seeing the, the dark side. So, you know, really ask yourself, even with the ones you're, you're choosing, what is the downside of, of selecting the software, the system integrator? And because in, it, not because you want to change your mind or second guess it necessarily, but because you, you just need to know what those risks are so you can manage around it. So I think that's, the first thing, and, and I guess the second thing is, um, you know, look outside the traditional, you know, software vendor ecosystem. Because if you look at what software vendors have done, they've created a very powerful biased ecosystem. You've got the software vendor, you've got the system integrators who are all peddling the same message. And then on top of that, you've got software vendors and system integrators who are paying industry analysts like Gardner and Forrester and those guys to put out reports about how great their technology is. So you, what you feel like is a third party, if I go to Gardner or Forrester, I look at their report and I see how awesome the system integrator is or the software vendor is, you just have to recognize that is a paid endorsement in many ways. That's what you're getting. Even media now with as much um, you know, readership that they're struggling to get with traditional print media and websites, even in those cases, they're, a lot of their content is paid for and commissioned by the software vendors. So you just have to recognize that the whole system, for lack of a better word, is sort of rigged. It's, it's rigged to convince you that their software is awesome and that you should use the, their system integrators. And that's where that's why I really like the independent third parties. And I'm totally, I'll caveat here, I'm totally biased because I started third stage and I, I believe in the model of independence and technology agnostic uh, approaches, but that's why I like that model 
so much is because we're representing clients. We're not representing software vendors or system integrators. In fact, a lot of vendors and software integrators don't like that we're here because we're not here peddling their message. We're not here supporting everything that they think is so awesome about their technology. And in many cases, they're right. They have awesome technology, but we also aren't afraid to point out what the deficiencies are and what the weaknesses are, or if there's a better option out there for them. They, they don't like that. Um, so I think that's the key is really look outside the traditional ecosystem and look to parties like third stage or like Raven Intel that aren't being paid to put out, you know, certain messages by the software vendors. Right. That it's not something that is being framed for your eyes, but that you're actually seeing it for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. One other thing that, um, you know, Bonnie didn't mention in, in her interview, but she did mention, you know, when we've prepped for the interview and also in previous conversations is that, you know, some software vendors really interesting. It's fascinating to me that some software vendors are super on board with her business and the business model. They, they love the idea. They like the transparency. They want to sort of partner with her to, you know, reach out to more customers to get more reviews and that sort of thing. And then there's others that she, she'll point out that just don't like it at all. They, in fact, she mentioned a couple specifically that just hate the model. They hate the fact that she's putting customer reviews out there. And to me, it's just fascinating. I'm like, why would anyone care or why would anyone be concerned that your customers are putting reviews out there for others to see. And to me, that's super eye-opening or, you know, sort of a, wow. uh, alarming, really. I'm so curious who, but I'll, I'll spare those companies. <laughs> yeah, and I'll spare her. I don't want to throw her under the bus because she obviously didn't want it in the interview. But, you know, right. just the fact that there are vendors that don't like it is tells tells me it all I really need to know about this, this industry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that speaks volumes to kind of, just the quality that these vendors are going to deliver. So anyways, I digress. But she also mentioned that software vendors can also recommend consultants. Um, from what I understood, it would be the independent third party consultant, right? Is there, does it go the other way too? If, if these are the consultants that the software vendor is recommending, could there be bias there? Um, and, you know, are they getting paid off? Have you seen that in the industry? Yeah. So first of all, usually when a software vendor recommends a third party to implement their solution, it's it's not an independent third party. I mean, usually that system integrator is a, you know, a formal partner of that software vendor. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is even when a software vendor recommends a certain system integrator, even then you have to take it with a grain of salt, even though you know that that system integrator is biased and fully, you know, supporting just that one software vendor. Um, that's not the reason you, you should be, um, you know, have your radar on. The, the reason is because um, the system integrators, uh, you know, the, the software vendors, I should say, prioritize the system integrators that are best at selling software. So the ones that are most likely to sell more licenses and more software are the ones that the vendors prefer to refer you to as a, as a buyer. So Parisa, if you're buying software, I'm not going to give you the best system integrator that's the best at implementing the solution necessarily, I'm going to refer you to the one that I think has the best chance of selling you my software. So that's the other thing is even if you already know what the software is you're going to implement and you already know that you're getting biased system integrators, you have to recommend that there's, or you have to recognize that there's a whole nother layer of bias, which is that even within their own ecosystem of, of biased system integrators, there's a pecking order of prioritization based on how much software they sell. And that's how they, a lot of these vendors will define like the platinum versus the gold versus the silver level of, of system integrators. And a lot of people look at that and say, oh, they're a platinum partner. Well, they're a platinum partner primarily because they sell a lot of software. They, they sell more than most. It doesn't mean they have a better track record of implementation. It means that they're selling more. So you have to recognize that the vendors are interested in selling software and they prefer the system integrators that sell more software. So I, I, I imagine like selling software that also ties into more customizations and almost like upsells and cross sells and oh maybe this would be a good fit for your organization as well in addition to you know type of conversation because the longer the soft or yeah the longer the software integrator is there the higher your bill uh you know they want to elongate the process so it's interesting to see how skewed it could really be uh when you're not fully paying attention and doing your due diligence yeah yeah absolutely it's very very That's true crazy. Now, she also mentioned interesting trends in 2020. Uh, projects were 10% more on budget, more on time. People were more satisfied with their projects in 2020 versus 
prior years and she mentioned that it could be because some of the projects maybe were smaller but then we also started talking about the remote delivery model and I'm curious about that because it's you know I've you know being in corporate America prior to this there is nothing more frustrating than those pointless meetings you know she mentioned you have status meetings to talk about your status meetings it's so true I mean when you're in an in-person setting there's a lot more fluff there's a lot more um you know I guess things that don't really get to the meat of the problem or, or solve the solution but when we're working remotely we're we're very to the point uh you know you have 30 minutes on on zoom right to figure out what's the solution to this problem so so it's more to the point and it makes sense that this remote delivery model would be the same in a digital transformation so I'm curious how that's been on the back end for a third stage and with your clients have you guys also seen um, kind of like a higher production um, or productivity rate with your clients this past year versus before given that you know maybe you're not experiencing the fluff or the extra meetings etc yeah or, or the travel you know for, for us as consultants the, the travel can you know eat up 20 percent of your week you know just going back and forth to and from a client um, so that in that's low value um, time that's being billed to clients typically. So, you know, travel time costs clients money and it costs you time as consultants. And you, you, you know, the, both of those things go away when you've got the remote delivery model. Um, but if, so to answer your question for us, I mean, we've, we've always traveled up until the pandemic and, and we're actually starting to travel again with, with several clients who are sort of easing back into the normal work uh, life. And uh, so we're starting to see some travel again just in the recent uh, last few months. But, um, you know, the, the pandemic itself in the remote model, it was very similar to what we were always doing because we always had sort of a hybrid where we would travel at certain points and at key points in the, in the project, but we weren't there 100% of the time. We would do the rest of our work remotely and collaborate, you know, digitally over Zoom or whatever. So we were already kind of doing that. It just, this took it to 100% remote for a period there. Um, so it, yeah, I, it did make us more efficient though, I, I'd say. Um, but having said that, you know, there is a lot to be said for, you know, being on site to meet people, to see the operations, to understand the culture and just have a deeper understanding of a client. That part is missing. Um, there's only so much you can learn from someone by talking to them on a zoom versus, you know, being at their office and seeing how they work day to day or seeing how the facilities are run. Um, so we miss some of that, but, um, you know, on the, on the flip side, it has reduced costs for a lot of clients. Right. That makes sense. I mean, there's something to be said about the face-to-face -face environment and how you can build those relationships, kind of dial in on the authenticity of both who you're working with on the third party uh, consultancy side, on the system integrator side. I mean, if, if another thing she said was system integrators are often kind of taking the land and expand approach during the software selection processes maybe under pitching the cost or, you know, positioning it in a way that's a little bit more appealing. And then once they get the contract, then it's expand and have all these, you know, add on type of things. So I guess in that scenario, is it easy to catch that when you're getting pitched on zoom or is it easier to catch it when you're in person? Does it make a difference in that scenario? Um, but oftentimes reading people, I think is a little harder to do virtually than in person. So, yeah. I totally agree with that. And I, you know, I'm, I tend to be a bit more old school when it comes to, um, you know, in-person relationships and that sort of thing. Even if a meeting could technically be done over Zoom, you know, there's a lot of times where I'd prefer just to be there in person and, you know, I would say shake someone's hand, but I guess you can't really shake people's hands anymore, apparently, or I'm not sure how that's going to work out <laughs> longer term, but in, historically I'd, I'd prefer to shake someone's hand or, you know, see them in person. Um, but, you know, you adapt and roll with the changes. So I'd be curious to see if that comes back or if we, end up in more of a hybrid mode going forward. Right. I, I'm guessing hybrid mode just across the board from working remotely to how we do uh, client meetings, et cetera. I imagine there's going to be an element of what we've been dealing with on the digital side uh, that'll stick moving forward. But we'll find out if we meet in person, I guess we'll just be doing the, the elbow instead yeah, of the, and the, the fist bumps and all that, all that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Yep. It's a well, good world. Yeah. It was crazy. Well, that speaking of crazy, uh, we, we'll wrap up this crazy episode and uh, hopefully we've gotten some good uh, uh, content out there for, for our listeners. 
Again, uh, if you're interested in this content or, or the show and hearing it more often, you can go to YouTube and watch us every Wednesday. We, we go live on YouTube. You can also watch all the, uh, the past episodes uh, that we've done prior to that. You can also subscribe to us on Google, Spotify, Pandora, and all the, the usual uh, podcast platforms. So thanks for being here again, Parisa. Uh, good to have you on the show again, and we'll see you all next time on Transformation Ground Control. Thank you.